Welcome to Inside Startup Investing, the only podcast where you can invest in every guest. On this episode, I will be speaking with CEO of Elf Labs, David Phillips. Elf Labs is a really unique company born out of a decade-long legal battle that saw David and his father win the intellectual property rights to the Junior Elf Book portfolio, which includes some of the most iconic Disney characters of all time, including Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, and many more. While the legal battle in and of itself could probably make for an incredible discussion, in this episode, some of the major things that stood out to me include, first, David and his team have already received an incredibly large offer for this business because of the assessed value of the underlying intellectual property assets they are sitting on. Point being, it is clear there could be many years of endless monetization at their fingertips that could turn Elf Labs into a major player in the entertainment and media space. Second, Elf Labs is recognizing the moment and looking to develop its IP portfolio by leading into new media channels that go direct to consumer. What do I mean by that? Instead of trying to win over big studios, produce movies with them, they are acting as the creators themselves and developing these shows for platforms like YouTube, where the eyeballs of this generation of kids live. Most of the fastest growing media companies today are YouTube first entertainment shops. Lastly, I would argue that the valuation in this round is high. But once you understand that A, they received an offer in the ballpark of the current valuation in all cash before they even began to monetize these assets, help me quickly gain comfort with their current valuation. And B, it says to me that you aren't really investing in a startup by backing Elf Labs. You are backing an asset, which is the IP of some of the biggest children characters of all time. That to me reduces the risk associated with this investment and potentially presents an interesting upside opportunity for investors as a begin monetizing portfolio. So with that, let's get on to the show and welcome David. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Great to be here with you, Chris. Yeah, great to be here with you as well. So for those that don't know, tell us a little bit about the history of Elf Labs and how you kind of came to, to run it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pretty exciting history, to be honest. Um, it started it back in 2006. My dad was able to acquire the original Junior Elf children's book portfolio. And we wanted to acquire the portfolio because it had it published children's books featuring Cinderella, Snow White, Rapunzel, characters that are some of the most highest grossing and valuable characters in history. And we knew that would allow us to have a precedent to go claim rights to those characters. And actually, a lot of the books were published before Disney ever did anything with those characters. Uh, we took the portfolio, we went to the United States Patent and Trademark Office and uh, basically started applying for trademarks. And this was a well over a 10 year process. And um, we got denied over and over, of course, because uh, they're very highly guarded and protected characters. But we kept appealing and we built our argument, we built our case and we had the Junior Elf books and it was based on that and other happenings took place. And we finally, literally at the highest appeals court where if we got denied there, my dad was just, we just going to shut it down and walk away. Um, we overturned the decision and that cascaded into, again, a 10 to 15 year battle of winning over 100 uh, more trademarks featuring classic and reinvented versions of these characters. Um, so our portfolio became pretty massive. My dad had an offer to sell the company when everything was complete. And that was his original thesis was build this portfolio. Once we own these rights, I'll, I'll be able to sell it. And he got a really, he got a, an offer for a lot of money. But I said to him, I had just finished vesting my ownership in my other startup. And I said to him, you know, I want to come to a new industry. I vested, I own it. I'm ready to, I, I can walk away with no repercussion. My partner's ready to, to run with it. Um, I'd love to take over. Look what I built. Look what we accomplished. It was pretty disruptive what I built in my other business. And um, I said, I want to do that here. I want to bring in technology. I want to bring in disruption. And I think we can change the whole entertainment industry. I think we can change the whole toy industry. And he totally bought into the vision. With And I have to like, credit to him, the entrepreneurial spirit in my dad was willing to not take the offer. I took over. I became the CEO. And uh, it's been about a year, year and a half process since then. And wow, a lot has happened. So uh, really, we're all really excited that we made that decision. So you own the IP to these characters. First off, help us understand kind of the value of these characters, dive into some of the ones that we're, we're most likely to truly know. Um, and then with those rights, help us understand what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So what does it mean, right? So the characters literally are Cinderella, Rapunzel, Snow White, Fairy Tale Princess, 
Uh, we have different brands. Preschool Princess. We own Sparkle Princess. We own Once Upon a Zombie, with his, which is a franchise with strong creative behind it. We're all the fairy tale kingdom as they came into a zombie wasteland featuring zombie Snow White and Rapunzel and Sleeping Beauty, etc. So all these different character franchises that each one in and of itself have the opportunity to be a billion dollar brand. Think, you know, Mattel's Barbie or Monster High or Paw Patrol or Spider-Man, right? Each one has the opportunity to be a billion dollar brand and we own all of them and we have the trademarks and the copyright protections behind them. So it's a very powerful holding. Um, and the idea, when, when we say monetize or build out or populate, it's literally every vertical from animation series to live action series to online immersive worlds where you can, you know, subscription revenue model to selling ad revenue when you have, you know, tens of millions of views on your YouTube channel to selling finished product to Netflix or Hulu or Paramount to doing uh, licensing deals with toy companies. So big 50, 100 billion or, or million dollar or billion dollar toy companies taking a license, manufacturing product, toys, uh, play sets and et cetera, distributing over the world, paying us a royalty. So, and then the royalty revenue has really high margin because royalty revenue is an asset light model. They do all the manufacturing and distribution. We just have to give them the protected and legal protected assets. So uh, that's like a tech level margin business, which is part of my vision when I told my dad. So I want to take an asset light model to the approach. And so it's really unlimited. When Bob Iger kind of first became CEO of Disney, right, many, many, many years ago, um, his thesis was we need to acquire as much exceptional uh, IP as we can, right? That's why he went and got Star Wars and Marvel and all of that with that simple concept of we're great storytellers, but that storytelling gets the opportunity to be monetized across everything from the movies to the characters to <laughs> the apparel, yada, yada, yada. There's a million ways to end up making money from these, you know, IP, these characters that people love and know. It's a vast world. Obviously, there's a lot of opportunity for you to pursue. As you think about kind of next steps, you know, I think you guys did about a million bucks in revenue last year. How do we get to 10 million bucks? How do we get to 20 million bucks? What are the things you're doing and putting in place to really start to scale this business? Great question. And, you know, and I'll add some context to that. So all the revenue we've made over the lifetime of the company, that was just happenstance. That was literally like we have these characters. We're trying to get, you know, a little bit of uh, we, we want to actually we want to we need revenue to um, have money to f build a legal case, to handle all the legal, to apply for trademarks, to defend them, to build them, to appeal. Like it's a very expensive and, and lengthy endeavor. And so when my, again, when my dad found the books and when that light, that lucky happening took place, if you will, when I say lucky, right? Smart and lucky. Um, we, we really like, we have to generate revenue to stay afloat. And so we actually generate over $15 million in the lifetime of the company and royalty revenue. That represents like hundreds of millions at wholesale, but that's with zero effort. That was literally all put right back into the legal. So the potential is like truly massive with just a little focus behind it. And that's what I told him is like, okay, you can sell based on no, re basically pre-revenue because the EBITDA was nothing because it all went back into legal. So I said, you can sell now. And he had an offer for 70 million, right? That shows the val inherent value, right? Pre-revenue losses every year. This is what we can sell for right now, or let's really come and build something here. And so the idea is that if we create content that's compelling and we have the best team to do it and we have the right licensing team and we have the right monetization teams, we'll be able to generate real revenue. I'm, like you said, 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. A successful toy can generate literally just one toy that hits success. It gets distributed. U.S., North America, uh, Europe. The market size is such that a successful toy can easily do hundreds of millions in sales. That means tens to 20 millions in royalties, right? And again, the royalty revenue, think ARR, right? Annual recurring revenue at that level, that can happen literally in an 18 to 24 month process only. It's almost even quicker than tech in a way if you have the right toy. We have the characters that are already recognized all over. We have some big announcements coming over. We just got green lit on a few series. Mm -hmm. And once you get the series produced and you start marketing it, and then you start selling the toys and then you start selling the backpacks and the t-shirts and the underwear and the socks and the party supplies and the toothbrushes, it gets really big, really quick. And so that's the focus, high quality creative with world famous characters, a tech layer that brings it to life like never before, and then monetization through all of those verticals. 
Well, it almost feels like to me, this is a portfolio optimization question of you got a hundred plus characters. You got to figure out which ones have the potential right now that are going to most resonate with audiences. And then obviously create the creative and have the right partnership, so on and so forth. Exactly. So as you're looking through your, your, your deep stack of, of characters, which ones do you see the most opportunity in? And then as you think about, okay, actually taking these to market through series and what have you, is this all going to be done in house or are you really looking to go, you know, hourly and work with, with big media partners? It's really a strong opportunity. And, and I, I'm glad you asked this because I think it also shows the value of the characters. Our first project officially is Robo Stars, featuring Robo Rapunzel, Robo Cinderella. There's very strong creative behind it. Again, I'll mention that the creative drives our concepts. We're not just going after a concept. It's, there's got to be a strong lore, mythology, and creative world behind it. And then we build our protections. RoboStars has a, a really brilliant forward-thinking methodology behind it. Um, the kids are going to love that they'll be inspired by, and they'll share positive values with the world. So we believe very strong in the creative. Now it happens to be when we focus grouped it, when I showed my six-year-old daughter and her classmates and her and the other class and the other school, they're going nuts when they see the art, when they see the concept. So we know it's going to resonate with kids and what's going to resonate. Now to the value of the characters, we have other franchises we didn't even try to sell that we got inbound that we got. That's part of the announcements I mentioned. They're going to come that we have another series that got greenlit as well. And so that's, and now we have a toy partner who's coming on board and he's going to manufacture a whole toy line distributed all over the world. So, and that's not even Robo stars. So it gets really big, really quick. Um, so we're leading with Robo. We're leading with the other one, which I'll announce in the near future. And those will be the two that we lead with first, because that's where the big opportunity is. And we think that's going to resonate with kids in a wonderful way. Well, and the next thing that you discuss is, you know, it's really important, right? The creative is, is, is very, very important in order for this to be successful. What does your team look like um, on kind of the creative side of the business that's going to really help you be successful in taking these characters and bringing them to life? So my dad's actually a, the creative force behind the concepts and the worlds that are built. Mm -hmm. um, and he, for just as an example and context on that point, he, uh, he wrote the novel Once Upon a Zombie. Um, just because I told him actually when I worked for the company prior to my startup, just as a commissioned sales, salesman, um, mm -hmm. he sa I said to him, you know, I want to sell zombie. Um, can you write something? We need some like lore behind it. And he wrote the book and it won t literally 12 awards. So he's a creative force. And so he's working in conjunction with Elise Rosenberg, who we brought on, who has hit shows on Disney, on other networks over her career. And uh, she's helping build the RoboStars world with my dad, as well as Mike Desev, who also has um, Emmy Award nominated creator, writer. And um, he's also helping build out the world. So we brought in best in class seasoned talent but what was important when I did this was that the talent shares our vision for disrupting the industry, not doing typical old school, um, you know, animated series selling, it, but to do a, really a new direct to consumer approach. And they really bought into our vision when they saw our technology, saw the characters we have, they saw the opportunity. Oh yeah, this thing can be big. You don't need somebody else for this. You have the character IP, you have the technology factor. So they got that. And, and that's who I wanted to partner with. So we have very seasoned, um, you know, pedigreed talent, but who share our vision. Well, when you talk about direct to consumers, so by that, do you mean producing series <clears throat> on YouTube instead of going traditionally trying to sell to a Disney? Yes. So, so when you normally co-produce or sell a series to a Netflix or a Disney or a Paramount, they'll buy it, they'll finance it or co-finance it. And they, but why do they do this? Consumer product merchandising generates on average in an animated three to five X multiple on the revenue from the app, from the um, entertainment itself. So the entertainment generates X amount of revenue and the merchandising is three to five X multiple, huge upside, like huge. And so it all, the, the series serves as a commercial for the consumer products. We don't want to give that away. We have the characters. We also have the team. My head of licensing, just as a quick parenthesis has done over $6 billion in licensing transactions in his career. So we have the team that we want to do this ourselves. And we want to maintain full creative control. And so we're going to produce finished goods. We're going to put it on YouTube. We have a proprietary marketing engine behind it that's going to help ensure that we go viral. I'm talking about an engine that is behind some of the biggest celebrities, musicians, and viral um, people on YouTube. I'm talking some of the highest viewed videos in the history. We have that same engine through relationships, 
that I can't speak about who it is, but we have that. And that engine we're going to put behind our series. So for sure, we want to go direct to consumer because that also brings huge ad revenue. That brings, you know, traffic pools where it brings so many other verticals of revenue, not even in our core model. That's just gravy. And but it allows us to talk directly to our audience and our fans. Then when the series is done and complete, I'll sell it to Netflix as a completed series. But we had all control and we keep all the consumer product upside. And so that's the true win for the company. And, and, and my understanding, again, just at a, at a high level is that, you know, uh, viewership, even for Disney and things like Disney Channel, um, traditional, you know, over the top television, it's just declining, especially for kids and kids are finding their entertainment, you know, on YouTube, right? Whether it's a Miss Rachel or any of the big influencer type people. Um, so it, it feels as though if there's going to be a growth segment for you to go after, I imagine the YouTube segment is where you need to be to really get the eyeballs. It's where, you, it's where you need to be and it's where you want to be. And yes, the whole old school industry is declining rapidly. And that's exactly what our thesis was. No, you have to go direct to the people. So it's really playing out. We're at a very lucky time. Like there's an inflection point taking place right now that we happen to, we thankfully are on the forefront of, that we have the IP, the creative and the approach that we can literally go directly to those people and live where the kids live. And that's YouTube. And when it comes to gaming, that's Roblox, right? And that's because kids can go directly. They have easy access and they can navigate the way they want, whether it's gameplay on Roblox or, vi or watching and consuming entertainment on YouTube. And so that's exactly what our stuff is made for. We have our own technology that allows our own platform, our own direct-to-consumer. Kids can navigate, they can watch, they can play in an easy, online accessible place, um, something no one else can offer. So it's a very strong opportunity as well. So we're very focused on that's where we want to maximize and monetize. <music> You know, in, in traditional media, right, capital intensity could be fairly high up front. It could take many years to produce a series, a movie, whatever it may be. Um, and then the payback period comes, you know, two, three, four years into the endeavor, right? And that's when you really start to see the revenues hit. But it's a pretty high intensity effort up front and high capital intensity effort up front. Um, from your perspective, you know, okay, you've kind of had this inflow of about a million bucks a year, whatever more just kind of happening through licensing this and the other thing. But in terms of when you'll be able to get, you know, your first series to actual, you know, to being on YouTube and tons of people watching it and then start seeing those revenues really increase. Is this a 2025 type of thing or is this like a 27, 28 type of thing? No, good question. So, you know, I actually like, so we're raising a, a round right now, right? And we're marketing to the community. And we had, as I mentioned, big offers. And by the way, we had more than one offer. I thought valuation. I don't usually say that. I talk about the offer we passed up, but we actually had two offers at that price to sell. We have a lot of institutional money who want to come in, who, you know, again, it's a character IP. It kind of speaks for itself. Um, but I wanted to go to the community because we want to democratize this opportunity. We want people in on the ground floor. I want the people funding the content, not the studios. And then the people own the piece of the company that gets all the upside. That's why we're doing this as well. Equally, as we want to share this vision with the world, we want literally to democratize it and change the way Hollywood is run, literally. And so that disruption is just as exciting to me. So with that context said, I want people to always be, you know, uh, take a conservative approach, right? Assume it's going to be 27, 28. That's better. I want expectations there. It happens to be, and I always try in building a business to put safeguards and to put you know, kind of stop gaps in where it allows us to create less downside, like insurance risks, like uh, get uh, revenue from other areas that weren't necessarily in the core model, but that makes sure that we actually grow earlier than later. Um, I have like my projection for the show to normal, you know, uh, 12 to 24 month projection to get live. I happen to have just built a relationship where we may be able to get live in eight to 12 months. But that's, you know, not my official projection, but I, I do try to work that way. And so I think, and then you also, when you do licensing deals, when you have uh, toy companies or backpacks or whoever who wants the license, they give you advanced payments against future royalties. So we're not just going to be, you know, once the sales start in two, three years from now, because that's when it gets manufactured and there's a lead time and it's got to get on shelf and you start collecting royalties, you do get advanced payments against that as well. And so we do definitely anticipate that towards Q3 of 2025, we're going to start to see a lot of revenue. And then talk to me about kind of the residual effect and, you know, how long 
kind of revenue bumps can can play out for even just one piece of IP, right? It's like, okay, you get it to market, it starts to go out there. I mean, right, Seinfeld characters to this day get paid, you know, I think Jerry gets $30 million a year um, just for the fact that it continues to live out there and people continue to consume it and buy things and all that. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about it as you build that portfolio of actually getting these characters into market, how that kind of compounds and grows over time. So, it, it, great Great question. And yes, exactly. It compounds and grows over time. That's exactly the way to say it. So by getting animated content that is sticky and enjoyable on YouTube, it creates a funnel. Because let's say you get 20 million views and let's say X percent subscribe and they want to keep watching, right? Like, you know who did this very successfully? Candle Media, right? With Moonbug and with Simple Songs and these different brands and, and uh, um, uh, Miss Rachel, right? If you love one of the episodes, you watch the next one, the next one, the next one. So if you are constantly putting out content on your Elf Labs YouTube channel and you've built to millions of subscribers, they're not just watching the first one, but they're watching the second, the third, and the fourth. And what happens then is you start generating ad revenue because we, we have that, again, we have that behind the scenes relationship and we're setting all this up. So we start generating revenue on the viewership of episode one, but then that funnels to episode two because of a certain percentage also watch episode two and three and four and five and it doesn't end. So as long as you're constantly putting new content and constantly bringing people to top of funnel, the re it gets crazy how big the revenue gets and how long it can run for. What's amazing is because of the characters we have, it's not just content because a, a successful content can do this on their own. It becomes merchandise because if you have all the views, you don't even need merch. You're, you're, you've changed your life financially. However, you now can do dolls and backpacks and t-shirts and you can do it in a hundred countries. So it's not just white, right? Like it gets really, really exponential really quick. And if the dolls do well, well then a percentage of that income go back into marketing to build it even bigger the next year. Think Barbie, think Paw Patrol, think the Disney princess. These brands that have done literally billions of dollars a year in revenue for 30 years plus, literally. And that's the goal. And that is exactly what we're going for. This is a long, long-term play where it doesn't end, where we constantly build. And our goal for the company is to be the studio of the future. When I say studio of the future, it means the people's studio, but we're bringing in billions in revenue. We're public with hundreds of billions market cap. And we're, you know, it's a long-term into the future play where we're distributing the world-class character franchises, just like something Disney has done successfully. Kind of going to ask you that next, which is you have over 100 characters in kind of your IP portfolio. So, you know, when you think about building out that entire portfolio, you could be talking about 10, 15, 20 years yes. of developing content around all of those characters. Um, so from your perspective, you know, when you think about kind of plan for the future, obviously you always have to keep all your options open. But, you know, do you see this as a standalone company becoming a massive studio or do you see this getting acquired by someone wanting to buy the IP and, and feeling as though that's a good exit for you guys? Great question. And you know what? It's funny because I've been, you know, I've been, we're building, right? We're working 14 hour days. We're building. I've been thinking, you know, we're getting hundreds of new investors a week right now. And so I've really been thinking about it. Like I really owe my investors that I put, that we deliver here and that we really put everything we have into this. And so I was thinking about it. Like what's our, the personal goal versus what's best for the company. And so I'm really, I really strive and I commit to really striving to doing what's best for the company. Maybe there's an exit in three years that the offer something that, you know, quote unquote, we can't refuse because it's going to put a 10, 20, 50, 100 X into all the investors pockets. Maybe not. Maybe no, it's the thing that you do have to give that up because you're going to go to billions and, and the exit's going to be 10 times bigger if you stick it out a few more years. My goal, all I can do, right? I'm not a prophet. All I can do is what I truly believe in my heart is best for the company with my advisors, with our team, what's best for the investors, um, each step of the way. I do believe we're gonna continue to have offers throughout this process. Um, we already, I, again, I have a huge deal that just closed that I didn't announce yet, that just happened to ha ha happen. That's the, by the way, that's a deal is on a level that we never had before in the 15 year history of the company. That's a deal where a lot, like it, it's crazy. Like it's, that would have been what I was dreaming of 10 years ago when I was working as a salesman. And it just happened because I've rebranded, I've repositioned, and we have a marketing effort going on. And I knew it would happen, and it did. So that's just the beginning. So I think, and that will be announced again in the, in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, I want to announce it right. So my point is that like it's just the beginning, and I think that the sky's truly the limit. We said it. We say it in our company video as a joke. With us, the whole cosmos becomes the limit, and we really mean that because there are so many franchises, like you said, easy 15, 20 years into the future, um, and that's the goal. 15, 20 years into the future. Sitting on all of these characters, obviously, there's already just a lot of like value in and of itself. But talk to me about some of the challenges that you're facing. You think you'll face. <clears throat> Uh, in trying to develop and build out this company? That's a great question. And you know, as a multiple time founder and entrepreneur, you know, that's kind of what happens, right? Like in people who do get a lot of success, they, right? It's always a 10 year overnight success, right? It's not an overnight success anywhere, anytime, but it looks like it is because once it hits, it goes very, very quickly. And even VCs bank on that, right? They invest in lots of companies. They just need one or two to hit. And also when they hit, it's not a slow growth, but it's this massive, uphill you know when we signed our docs with our other vcs and my other startup we literally had like clauses that we're not allowed to run it as a lifestyle business we're not allowed to build profit we must keep growing like we actually have to commit to that because you when it starts you can really get really big really quick the challenges have been 15 years already right it's the legal it was getting the rights to all these characters it was overturning those decisions and risking our last dollar to do it uh it was getting licensees who would you know pay in advance and, and fund and, and go distribute before we had any content or anything so we can put it back into legal and building more portfolio it's which ip to start with first it's how do we monetize quick enough how do we run fast enough it's it's all those type of things i'm starting to sense that we're getting to an inflection point where you know, once it starts it's like 10 year overnight success i think we're i'm starting to feel we're getting to that overnight success point generally it's sleepless nights because it's you know ideas and it's how can i create more value and how can i be more efficient and how can i make sure the company runs right and there's company culture there's company team and then there's the product itself um but it's starting to get fun it's starting to get fun which is a good sign if you like what you heard on the show today you can check out why elf lab scored a 3.5 out of 5 at kingscrowd.com you can now invest at elflabs.com until april 1st 2025 and please like, subscribe, and share our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so more listeners like you can find us. Thanks for listening.